This is uh, HIV in the Rust Belt. They are making a film about David's house. And Holly, is the film called Compassion? No, it's called, well, it, it, it's loosely right now called HIV in the Rust Belt. Um, but the film itself is about David's house compassion and residents and people who serve David's house compassion. Well, thank you. I will let you guys take over then. Okay. Go ahead, Allie. Right. Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone who has been part of um, organizing this uh, this um, virtual band books vigil. It's been really fun to see it all come together. And I know it must be an incredible amount of work. And it feels even more important in this era of fake news that we sort of celebrate and think about um, the power of um, uh, free free speech, right? So my name is Allie Day and I'm an associate professor in disability studies here at the University of Toledo. And in addition to thanking the College of Arts and Letters for investing in all of our research and scholarship, um, Holly and I want to particularly thank the Office of Research and Sponsored Programs for awarding us an interdisciplinary research initiation award this past summer. Um, what we want to do this afternoon, we're going to sort of present in three parts. So what we want to do this afternoon is to show you all a bit of the film that Holly and myself and um, Lee have been working on uh, in collaboration with Sue Carter and Richard Meeker at UTMC's Ryan White Clinic, Sarah Mouch at, in the University Archives, and Lee Fernside, independent artist and grant writer. We also have had a few amazing camera operators and assistant directors, Gabe, Ali, and Marcus, all students and or graduates of the film program here. So I'm gonna begin with giving a broad overview of the film and how the project came into being, as well as some of the things I'm thinking about as a disability studies scholar and co-producer of the film. Following that, Holly is going to walk you through some clips of the film in progress. And then Lee Fernside, co-producer and photographer, is gonna show some stills and talk about where the project goes from here. So the film, which we are calling HIV in the Rust Belt, comes out of a larger initiative that I began about five years ago in the aftermath of some field research that was contributing to my book project. As part of that project, I had the privilege of meeting and working with several folks at the Ryan White Clinic here in town and realized that many of my collaborators were longtime activists and community care workers in the HIV field. And the stories they told were strikingly different from what I had learned about HIV history, a history that when told nationally largely focuses on activism on either coast. So I began a digital oral history project with Sue Carter giving me names and contact info of nearly everyone she could think of that was still around. And I did this in starts and stops, working with the Canada Center to upload it online. Then last summer, 2019, Sue Carter approached Holly Hay and I about doing a film project to interview long-term survivors. Film is clearly not my purview, but I was eager for, for a meeting and, I, and recognizing the importance of, of documenting survivor stories. As we got together and brainstormed, Holly and I had never met before, it became clear that we could not produce a feature length project in the three months that Sue originally proposed. She wanted something to premiere at the December 1st World AIDS Day event. But we could begin interviewing survivors. So on a hot day in August, 2019, we interviewed five long-term survivors, two women, three men, one Latinx, one African-American, three white, two ex-felons, three parents, some queer identified, some straight, the stories were diverse. At Band Books last year, we were able to screen some rough cuts of these interviews. Some of you may have been there. And we got an overwhelmingly positive community response. And so that is where the work we did this summer picks up. One of the threads through all five um, narratives of survivors was the appreciation and or love for this place called David's House Compassion. Um, and just a side note, it's called David's House Compassion because David's House was already taken as a name and they couldn't copyright it. So they added compassion to the end of that name. I had heard about David's House years ago in my early days of collecting oral histories and was struck by what seemed like the uniqueness of the grassroots organizing and the longevity and reputation of what became a kind of Toledo establishment. I was thrilled when Holly turned to me following our long day of interviews in 2019 and said, what's David's House? That seems important. And I said, that's the angle. So we set out this summer to try to tackle a telling of the story of David's house compassion through the eyes of survivors who lived in or utilized its services, as well as employees and volunteers. I spent hours in the Kennedy Center archives, once lockdown permitted me to, um, reading David's house papers, all of which were donated years ago. 
Through 13 years of board meeting minutes, handwritten thank you notes, and fundraising flyers, I pieced together a timeline that begins in 1988 and ends in the early 2000s. I'm going to read a few excerpts for an essay that I've been, been writing for a special issue of Culture, Health, and Sexuality that I thought might help us connect well with some of the clips that Holly is going to show. It takes us a year to convince Sue to do an interview for the film. It also takes us a year to convince her colleague Richard, who's here today, um, now in charge of fundraising and development for the Ryan White Clinic, but who worked weekends at David's house in the height of the epidemic, to be interviewed. It's another humid day when we meet in, in the front room of Rusty and Elaine's place, the former David's house. They sit side by side, matching Ryan White Clinic t-shirts that they coordinated in advance. Disposable masks covering their mouths and nose, the beginnings of perspiration beginning to shine on their brows. We turn the fans off to control for noise during the film. The house has no central air. I asked Sue to tell me her story first. She removes her mask to breathe more easily and begins with a, with a comfort that says she's told this story many times in her 30 years of aid service work. She calls herself a fluffy blonde who worked in window decorating after a college degree in interior design. She likes to go to discos with her male coworkers. She became close best friends with one colleague, an out gay male who learned of and died from his HIV before anyone knew much about the virus. Sue threw herself into advocacy beginning first with an informal buddy program, then serving on the board of David's house, and eventually going back to earn her MSW so she could be a social worker in the field. And this is why she knows everybody. Richard too became involved with AIDS service work after a friend was diagnosed with HIV and moved into David's house in his final year. Richard describes for me the LGBTQ scene in Toledo in the 1980s and early 90s a time when the small, economically depressed city had 12 gay bars, each with a different night of the week featuring cheap drinks alongside drag, drag shows or pool competitions. I learned that the pancake house up the street from my own house used to share a space with a leather bar. I am delighted to think about this every time I walk my dog. It was through a close friend who lived at David's house that Richard first came to know it. When an opportunity to work as a weekend attendant opened, he jumped on it. It is through Richard that I learned of the incredibly pop popular SRO fundraisers that became Toledo's social event of the season. It is through Richard that I learned the room where we are sitting, the front parlor, served as a TV room for the residents. But when one resident couldn't navigate the stairs to the bedroom and was almost turned away from housing, the group gave up their television and turned the room into a private hospice room. I'm struck by the generosity and care embedded in this building, the ghosts of Caring's past. I ask both Sue and Richard to tell me what they know about the early days of David's house, how they found the building, what kind of renovations were needed. The building itself is an old rectory owned by the Catholic diocese. They were able to rent the building provided the group fundraised the thousands of dollars for renovation needed to make the place habitable. Sue tells us of the condoms found in the walls when they began demolition. Perhaps it's just hearsay. Neither Sue nor Richard nor anyone else I interview were present during the renovation. The condom story is one people like to tell though, a seedy part of, of the Catholic rest, uh, uh, sorry, um, a seedy past for this Catholic rectory, but suitable for an organization that promoted safe sex and provided free condoms in the height of Toledo's epidemic. I asked them to tell me about Sister Elaine. Sue exclaims, reminiscing, she was a character. I know this because she has written all over the archives, a figure that volunteers to head committees, who contacts the area diocese for available homes to renovate for the project, who people write thank you letters to in the dozen. She says that Sister Elaine had a strong personality, one that was divisive. She was someone who exclaimed when a resident was being obstinate and rude, quote, I don't care if you have AIDS, you don't get to be an asshole. No one knows what happened to Sister Elaine. After the first few years of board meeting records, the paper trail ends. I know David's house housed consistently five residents at a time, its max capacity, for more than 12 years. I also know from archival records that the demographics changed, that the board discussed the need to pivot services toward Black women, many of them mothers. There was a discussion about whether the house should be just for gay people. While I don't have recordings or details from these board conversations, the archives have evidence of women and men living in the house together, of some in the Black community assisting in fundraisers, of tensions between the house and the Black church. There's also a fundraising plan in the late 1990s to build an extension of apartment housing as part of DHC in order to provide living accommodations for women with children. The building project becomes reconceived as a modest extension for community services, not housing. 
The early days of David's house in so many ways represent a form of disability justice. Disability justice is, quote, a movement building framework that would center the lives, needs, and organizing strategies of disabled queer and trans and or black and brown people marginalized from mainstream disability rights organizing's white dominated single issue focus, end quote. At the time when David's house was imagined, there was a robust independent living facility that organized around disability rights in town, and yet no collaboration between the Ability Center of Northwest Ohio appears in the written records of David's house compassion. In context outside Toledo, I know that in order to achieve disability rights, there's a long history of white disability activists distancing themselves from multiply stigmatized populations, especially those living with a new virus at the time of the most active organizing of the ADA in the 1980s. Whatever the reason was for not more robust collaboration or long-term coalition building between HIV activists and disability activists in Toledo, the fact remains that David's House was doing disability justice work. As Patty Byrne writes, quote, a disability justice framework understands that all bodies are unique and essential, that all bodies have strengths and needs that must be met. We know we are powerful not despite the complexities of our bodies, but because of them. Disability justice holds a vision born out of collective struggle, drawing upon the legacies of cultural and spiritual resistance within a thousand underground paths, igniting small, persistent fires of rebellion in everyday life, end quote. One of the things that most embodies literally disability justice in the way residents care is the way residents cared for one another, in addition to volunteers and staff. One resident we interviewed was Chico, and he writes of his friend, and he tells us of his friend Pete, for whom he delivered meal plates and turned on his favorite VHS, The Wizard of Oz. When Pete dies, Chico experiences the loss personally. This kind of crip caring resonates with what disability justice organizers call care webs, informal networks of volunteers and friends that provide for one another, organizing systems of security and care when state and other formal resources fall through. At the same time that I am claiming the work of David's house as a form of disability justice, I question my assertion. The board members are primarily white, many LGBTQ identified, and I can only guess that some are seropositive. But many board members and employees are also straight, white, cis women. The long-term beloved CEO was a woman with grown children, beginning a social work career. Did they center knowledge of Black and brown people in their organizing? Yet, in reading the work of Leah Lakshmi Peeps and Samaracina, who identifies as a queer disabled femme, there's an important part of the early work of David's house that, if not disability justice work, is in coalition with disability justice. She writes, quote, Many of us rely on state funding and services to survive and fight for things like the Affordable Care Act and the Americans with Disability Act to remain protected and expanded. But our focus is less on civil rights legislation as the only solution to ableism and more on a vision of liberation that understands that the state was built on racist, col colonialist ableism and will not save us because it was created to kill us." End quote. And indeed, the early organizing of David's house was focused on providing care, food, housing, end-of-life support, and not explicitly on state recognition or policy. In fact, David's house emerges because there were a few other local HIV groups providing support to local public health and state agencies, but no one was doing the work of direct care. Early board meeting minutes insist on not losing the focus of providing concrete care and resources for those with HIV and their families, chosen or otherwise. I wonder if the early organizing of David's house is reminiscent of the kinds of politics that Kathy Cohen famously insists upon when she writes of the AIDS epidemic and the queer community's resistance to addressing intersectional oppression. She calls us to form coalition based on shared relationships to power, understanding that when we do this, we decenter white middle-class politics. Cohen writes, quote, I envision a politics where one's relation to power and not one's homogenized identity is privileged in determining one's political comrades. I'm talking about a politics where the non-normative and marginal position of punks, bull daggers, and welfare queens, for example, is the basis for progressive, transformative coalition work, end quote. We might replace Cohen's punks, bull daggers, and welfare queens with quote, homeless, formerly incarcerated drag queens and welfare queens, but the sentiment is the same. David's house housed a cross-section of those marginalized by HIV infection in relation to other forms of racist, sexist, homophobic, capitalist violence. And now I'm going to turn things over to Holly, who will walk you through some clips. Hello. Thank you, Allie. Thank you, Paulette and everyone. Um, hi, Richard. Hi, Sue. 
Uh, Paulette, I think your support is a testament of your passion for the work and, um, you know, that people want to be a part of this says a lot about you. So thank you. Well, thank you so very much. You're very welcome. Um, I'm just, I'm going to show um, a six minute section of the interview that we did with Richard and Sue this summer. Um, I don't know if they're prepared for this, <laughs> but it's just the beginnings. It's actually the first time I've actually touched the footage um, this morning, but it, it will put Allie's words um, uh, to life, so to speak, and we'll hear them telling a little bit of their stories of how they got involved in David's house, what the culture in Toledo was like at the time. Um, uh, yeah, but again, it's only six minutes, so hopefully everybody should be able to see and hear just fine. So fingers crossed. I got a degree in art from the University of Toledo. Oh, hold on, my drive went to sleep. <laughs> and he came from San Francisco. Oh, let me start it over, sorry. I got a degree in art from the University of Toledo, and I wasn't very talented, so I became a display person. I decorated stores. And I had a boss, and he came from San Francisco, and he got very sick one day. And he went to the hospital, and he never returned. We didn't know until years later what had happened to him, figuring it out. They never had a, the store, J.L. Hudson Company, was 100 years old and never had a woman display manager. So, because no one wanted to come to Toledo from the big city of Detroit, I got to be the display manager. And I went to all these sales meetings and to New York and to gay bars with all these men. And I was the only woman. And I learned to appreciate my gay friends and what they went through. And in those days, some of them were married. They didn't want to be. Some of them were outlawed by their family. Some of them were told to go to church. Some of them were threatened with lobotomies. It was terrible. And so I did that work for a real long time. I, I decided I needed to do something more with my life. So I went back to school and became, uh, while I was still working, and became a, um, got a degree in counseling. And I wanted to be a gay affirming counselor because there wasn't many around. Well, all of a sudden, one of my gay friends and some of my gay friends and the rest of my gay friends are saying, I got this thing called HIV. And my best, best friend, Harold, with my dance partner, my disco partner, he said to me one day, while we were still decorating stores, I got, um, I went over to UT Medical Center and I got this test and I said, yeah, I've heard of that. It's in California and people get sick, but you're so healthy. By the time Harold died, I was his social worker and ordered hospice to his home. So I've been working in this field at the same hospital for almost 30 years. Before that, two years of the health department doing counseling. A year before that as a volunteer with David's house and anything else that would have me be there, you know. So that I knew that that was what I was supposed to do. You know how you have a mission? You just know. I never questioned it. Never had a second thought about it. AIDS got a name in 81. My boss probably died right about that time. But he had come from San Francisco, which is where the hotbed, San Francisco and New York, came to Detroit. No one, he had these terrible headaches. I called him on the phone when he was in the hospital. He didn't remember who I was. He probably had cryptococcal meningitis. I was getting calls from the hospital saying, what kind of what kind of plants are you using? What kind of baskets do you have? We had imports from all over in our displays. They couldn't figure out why he died. And then years later, it was just like, oh, that's what it was. I got involved in, in David's house in 1991. Um, I came back from a short uh, stay in California and came back to Toledo and a friend of mine was living here um, at David's house at that time and I would come over here to visit uh, him at night after work and things like that and then um, I was here from like March through the end of June and my friend Todd that lived here um, told me that there was a position that was available for a weekend attendant here at the house. And so um, I submitted an application and um, had an interview set up with Rusty, who was the uh, residence manager at that time. And um, 
did the interview, I left. Um, at that time I wasn't driving and I walked over to the bus station across the street. He walked out and um, hollered for me and brought me back in the house and told me that I had the job. And so I started 4th of July weekend um, in 1991 because of my friend Todd um, that lived here. And by um, August, mid-August, I think it was, he passed away. And, um, you know, my career here um, started really with that weekend um, attendant position where I basically would move in on Friday and um, leave on Monday morning at 8 o'clock. And... <clears throat> Uh, basically what you know that position did or the you know the care positions that were there where they were making sure that all the needs of the um, residents that lived here um, were taken care of um, and there were many of those um, there were some residents that lived here that were um, more able to do for themselves and then there were some that needed constant 24-hour um, around-the-clock care because at that time there really was a lot of um, nursing homes or hospice facilities didn't want to take clients that were HIV positive um, because of fear um, and stigma, and we're still battling that today. So um, that's really how I got involved. It's hard to think of anything in terms of anything else but AIDS, but um, you can talk to the gay world and I can talk to the political world. I mean, it was a time of, of strong unions, working class town. Uh, but, you know, the town had a heart when it came to people with AIDS. Maybe not people who were gay, but people with AIDS. Uh, somehow that moved them to another level. And they did a lot of neat stuff, like city council passed a non-discrimination uh, uh, act that you couldn't discriminate against people with AIDS in housing. And um, people were raising money. There was a couple competing organizations in town, as there always was. You know, if you read any book about any organizations that are growing, there's competition. But Soon it was just one big group helping people with HIV and AIDS. And the center, I have to say, was our hospital and David's house because no other hospital would take our patients. They'd be ushered out the back door, go to UTMC without even a referral. Go to David's house, can't get into a nursing home. Go to David's house, your family kicked you out. Go to David's house, you'll get some food. It, it was always that center of, of care for people with HIV. <clears throat> are we uh, are we going to talk about this, Ellie, or are we going to move on to Lee and then come back? Ellie, if you if there's anything that you want to say just right now in terms of like why you how you put the, the that that sort of segment together, what you were thinking about when you put that together, that might be helpful before we go on to okay. Lee. So what I've been showing up to this point in time is Chico's story, and I've been spending most of my time developing and authoring that. Um, and most of the public screenings have centered around that. But today, I wanted to try to give David's house a broader context. And so Richard and Sue are, are some of the vehicles that are able to do that. Um, so in terms of what I chose to show today, it was just about, okay, how can I introduce the characters that are going to introduce the central theme of the, of the film? And that was, that was my decision making. So this is really very rough in terms of, this is sort of like I, um, like we sort of treated the content last year at Band Books, which was a really nice launching pad um, because we were just showing Talking Heads A-roll stuff. Um, but the content of what was being said, I think really um, impacted people. I've actually heard some great feedback last week um, at the, the brown, ba the brown bag um, racial justice series. So th that was my decision making for today, just to try to give uh, Richard and Sue some screen time and uh, try to give David's house a little broader context to be understood. Thank you, thank you, Holly. And I just wanna say, I think in my um, essay, I said that their shirts were white and they're totally black t-shirts, which is like, how did my memory do that? <laughs> um, so I'm gonna change that um, in the okay. final um, okay. presentation. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm really very excited 
So my commitment now from, from this moment forward until the screening in December for World AIDS Day is to take their entire interview and to form it and to shape it into something with B-roll, uh, specifically from the archive. Um, again, sort of broadening our understanding, the audience's understanding of what David's house was. Mm -hmm. And then uh, cutting that either before or after or in with at least Chico's story to some degree. But we'll see, that seems like a rather big goal <laughs> at this time to cut them together. Right. Thanks, Holly. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you. We're gonna, um, I, I forget how long we have. We have until about one o'clock, is it? Is that right? Um, but we're going to have um, Lee sort of talk a little bit about um, the use of still photography in the film and then sort of a little bit about where we might go from here. So Lee is our other co-producer. And I just want to make sure that we thank the Ann Loker Fund also for their um, support of this project. And Holly, you have to stop sharing your screen so that I can share my screen. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay, so um, I'm actually gonna talk a little bit in reverse of what Ali said. So some of what you could tell from what Ali and Holly said is that there's a lot of stories going on. There's the stories of the five people that they interviewed two years ago, which is kind of wacky. All of the other people that um, Sue and others have referred um, to the production team, um, Richard and Sue themselves, and of course all their archival material. So one of the big challenges um, is to try to figure out how to connect these stories with the larger stories of the systems that people exist within. I'm totally saying that for you, Helen. Um, and a, one way to do that is to really start to think about audience because there is no such thing as a general audience, right? You can't say I'm making something for a general audience because what does that even mean? So we we're trying to break down who would be interested in this project. Um, and so here are some of the different segments, audience segments that we thought of. And um, the PBS audience is actually very broad, even though I just said there is no such thing as a general audience. 86% of all television households watch a PBS show sometimes during the year. Um, that's 211 million people in the U.S. PBS is actually the fifth most, fifth highest rated network, for lack of a better word, um, after uh, the big three and Fox. Um, so we are going to try to distribute the final film through a distribution agency that um, programs work for the PBS member stations. <laughs> um, but we also, that, you know, distribution has a relatively limited life. And we are all committed to trying to figure out how do we also extend the life of this project beyond the distribution. Uh, so, um, really, we've started to talk about this as a multi platform project. Um, that yes, we will have this feature film or series of short films um, using these materials that we've started to talk about, but are there other ways that we can access these different audiences through different materials? So um, can we create uh, curricula or study guides and uh, educational resources online that would make it appealing to uh, either university programs and or high school programs? to really use it as an advocacy and educational tool. Um, academic and conference presentations, because um, they are academics, <laughs> that's what they do. I have to confess, I am a former professor, so I understand the need for that. Um, but also, conference presentations are a way to connect with other professors in the field and to try to get them to be excited about screening the work um, in their classrooms. Really excited about that possibility. But also, Allie and I have started talking about could this be a book for um, a general audience? So not an academic press, um, but a press like Beacon Press, which is an independent press that deals with kind of typically social justice issues, so that it can have another audience. And that's where the photographs come in. Um, I've started taking photographs uh, for the production 
because all productions need still photographs for marketing, but thinking about is there another life for those photographs and what does it mean to photograph um, people with disease? So first of all, I should say <laughs> some of these images I'm about to show are graphic, but um, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. Okay, so what do medical photographs of disease look like today? This is shingles, but you can't see the person. The person is completely disembodied. All it is is skin, granted a specific type of skin, <laughs> skin and the condition. There's no context whatsoever. Um, and it's easy for us to think about things as ahistorical. Like this is what we expect from a medical photograph. So certainly this is what they've always looked like. And in fact, they're not true. So for me, again, as perhaps because I'm a former professor, um, I look back to our history for inspiration. And although these photographs I'm about to show you, they wouldn't have thought themselves as our history, but the archive of photographs. So when photography was invented almost 200 years ago, and in the early mid 19th century, everyone wanted to have their picture made. And there were studios um, that cropped up. And you see the same types of props that signal things about what the person who's having their portrait made, how they want it to be seen and perceived. Now, Matthew Brady was a very famous photographer in New York. He photographed um, US politicians, and in this case, um, the emperor of Mexico. But with this person, how he was dressed, how he was standing, the studio props, in this case, just the curtain and the chair, really signaled to the viewer who he was, his status, what he was supposed to be in the world. And I just want to contrast that with a portrait of um, a woman with a, I don't even know what her condition is, but if you can see her knee, she's got something going on. And you can tell that there's very similar, similar pose, similar props. It's a studio portrait, except that it also pictures her medical condition. Um, so just to bring home the point that it was as if she walked in off the street to a portrait studio and used the same visual language of 19th century portraiture to have this medical document made. It's a far cry from that shingles picture in which the person affected was not even a person at all. Even when we're starting to see, this is syphilis, late stage syphilis, um, more kind of close-ups of conditions, still they're using the language of a portrait photograph. We still see her hat and her earrings and that she's on a chair. Again, a far cry from portraying disease as just disease and not with a person attached. So those are some things that I'm thinking about as trying to make these photographs. Now, some of it is also that we're making this during COVID. So whenever anyone sees this picture for the rest of our lifetimes, this will signal, this will signal coronavirus, right? Um, so in a way, I am already having to picture disease, even if this particular person um, isn't affected, as far as we know, right? Um, so this is Chico, one of the people that was interviewed. And then, so because we can't picture his HIV, perhaps I can instead picture him with all of his stuff. Because even if you don't know his stuff, you can, and you can't see the stuff in the background, because of the shallow depth of field, you can still tell that this is a guy who has a lot of stuff. <laughs> stuff is important. So these are things that I'm thinking about as I'm trying to make these photographs um, as part of the project as a whole, is how do we portray people? Like what are some of the questions that can give them uh, like an authentic representation, if that's even like a legitimate thing? How can I use my camera to show these, you know, are the characters from within our film. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing. That was really kind of my thing. <laughs> but I would be interested to hear if anyone has questions for any of us, since we have nine minutes left. We have some time. So do we have questions? And we have to wait. There's a slight delay on our social media. My friend Donna from, from Arkansas sent me an email. She's on YouTube, so that's exciting. Did she send it about this project? 
She said she's watching. Okay. Just Hi, Donna. That she's watching. So. One thing that I'll say, and, and just in response to some of the ideas that Lee threw out there, is that in disability studies, there's been um, quite a bit of writing by people, some by people who have been pictured in medical textbooks to talk about that disembodiment and, and subject, you know, their subjectivity um, and the kind of violence that that does. Um, and also people thinking about the historical use of photography, right? That, that photography really develops as a field and as an art form alongside the medical field, right? So, so the medical field is gaining prestige and reputation in the late 1800s, right? And so those two things are coinciding with one another. They need one another. Um, in the early 20th century to really work together. So I think the relationship between photography and visual image and disability and disease is actually a really important one that will be interesting as we move into thinking about quote unquote invisible disabilities like chronic illness, like HIV or Corona um, and, and sort of thinking about what it means to make those visible through the film. Well, do, we have, do we have any questions? Yeah, I was I was uh, picking up on your uh, work with the Kennedy Center. I work at the Kennedy Center myself, and uh, and uh, I'm aware of the uh, the David House Compassion Collection. And I was uh, thinking, you know, should I digitize some of those for our digital repository? But uh, uh, due to the personal nature of uh, some of the content, I did not really know whether I, how I should proceed, but perhaps it's something that I can uh, work in uh, collaboration with uh, you or the Disability History Program and see what would be helpful to put up there and uh, something that would be okay for public access, uh, but at the same time it would, it would uh, you know, keep the private uh, stuff out because it can be intensively, uh, you know, uh, personal. And, and because of the HIPAA and other uh, kind of, uh, of uh, issues that uh, you may violate if you put things up. But at the same time, if I can make this more relevant for your academic uh, uh, you know, program and your curriculum, I think it may, would be a great addition if uh, we could work together and see what kind of matter would be, what kind of uh, items uh, would be suitable or helpful for your particular program and so that they can access it online. Because as you mentioned, uh, access to the Kennedy Center is very limited. And so adding the digital collections so would probably be uh, timely uh, these days. And so, you know, we can uh, meet or discuss this and see what would be uh, something that you would be interested in seeing on. And then we can add that as a digital collection on our digital repository, which is utdr.utolido.edu. Yeah, Ajahn, I think that that's an, um, an awesome idea because I've been working with Sarah um, over there just to pull the archives, right, and to dig into the boxes. Um, yeah. And she's also been sort of recruited into everything that we film, all the interviews that we do for the film are also going to go into the digital oral history archive, yeah. right? So to have visual things alongside that from the David's House papers would be awesome. One of the things that I can say about the archive is that it doesn't include any personal medical information of any resident, for instance. Okay. So most of what's, um, the bulk of it is board meeting minutes, which for me are fascinating um, and amazing to sort of think about the relationships and evolving relationships. But um, there's also fundraising materials that are in there that I think would be visually really interesting. And thank you notes, I think, were, are, are really um, interesting and wonderful to sort of bring um, embodiment to the project in some way. Um, there's photo some photographs, um, like sort of public photographs from news stories and that kind of thing. Okay. Um, but there's no protected HIPAA information in there. Even when they talk about, if they talk about residents like in a board meeting minute or something, um, if they're using their first name, which sometimes they're not even using their first name, like they're not recording that. Um, and then they have like in um, director reports, they have like statistics of residents so you, so you know like oh we had two women living here and whatever but you don't have um, any sort of protected private information in those archives so um, that's something that they've been really um, careful about um, archiving and protecting which is one of the awesome things about you guys over at the Canada Center. There's also other um, archives too that are helpful like we have archives from Caesar Show Bar which is one of those amazing bars that Richard um, talked about. Um, uh, and, and I think that that has some amazing like visual things that could also be adjacent and, and sort of add to the visual um, pieces of the film. Um, 
so yeah, I think there's some interesting stuff there. So yeah, we'll definitely, I just wrote down email Arjun to talk about the archive. So I will be in touch with you for sure. That would be great. Sure, we had these in our uh, in a recent uh, uh, in a physical exhibition at the Kennedy Center, mm -hmm. uh, I think a year ago or so, mm -hmm. and I did a visual uh, a virtual exhibition, so I added some of that material there, but not it's not in our uh, digital collection per se. I would uh, keep them by collection by collection, but uh, yes, definitely that's something yeah. that we can do. And uh, I don't know if, where do you keep your digital oral histories. Um, let me, I, you know, we're, I'm going to loop in Sarah and the three of us will, will start talking and we'll figure out some of the logistics. Okay. Well, thank you. Yeah. So I had a question. Do you ha is Sarah a media relations person or an attorney at David's Compassion House that you have to go through to do your filming and interviewing? So oh, that's a that's a really great question. So David's house no longer exists as an entity, oh. right? So it closed, um, and they were um, incorporated under another um, nonprofit entity that then was incorporated under another nonprofit entity. And so we had to sort of trace who has the rights to this archival material for filming. And so what we found out was that um, through a series of sort of um, uh, I forget the, you know like. Um, nonprofits merging, right? Um, Equitas Health, which is a local, a big HIV Oregon town and um, in the state, they had the, the right. So um, it took a little bit of fact finding and trying to find the right person to talk to over there um, for them to give us the rights to film that project. And they, they weren't even really sure what I was asking and I'm not sure they knew um, that they had these papers, right? Um, so that's one of the interesting things about working in the archive is that if on the time that they're donated, they don't give the rights over to the archive, then you have to hunt down and figure out, well, who, what entity actually owns these? And so that took some work this summer to try to <laughs> trace that down, but they have given us the rights for filming that material. Well, I'm glad you were able to do that. Mm -hmm. 